Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm Kimi. Uh, very happy to be here today. So the idea behind this talk is essentially a project that the University of Alabama and Canonical did together last winter. So at the university, they already had an HPC uh, environment and an OpenStack based uh, environment for their users. But in terms of containers, all of the different environments were like on laptops, containers here and there, some Docker Swarm over there. And the idea was to provide a dedicated Kubernetes platform to their users. And so uh, we worked together to get this done. And um, we're gonna go today through the Kubernetes architecture that we chose and a few of the integrations that we've done. And then uh, my colleague, John Paul, will go a little bit more through what uh, type of research they do and, and how they leverage that infrastructure um, for the research. So for the Kubernetes architecture, um, in this case, we're talking about a Kubernetes on bare metal deployment. So um, when we talk about bare metal deployments, we want to have some infrastructure nodes. You can also call them like management nodes. Essentially, those are outside of the Kubernetes deployment um, to be able to manage the Kubernetes environment. Um, so the first technology I'll highlight here is the Metal as a Service um, platform. So Maz is a bare metal provisioning tool, super useful when you have a, a large estate of bare metal servers. Uh, it provides you with your asset inventory. You can do uh, a layout of the type of storage layout, uh, networking, um, and, and all of the layout that you want to do when you pixie boot and deploy your servers can be automated through Maz. Uh, so that was a really useful tool to use. Um, then to choose which machine we're deploying and to deploy them uh, with to deploy the OS and to deploy different applications. We're using Juju. Um, Juju is called also a operator lifecycle controller. Essentially, it's um, one of the best aspects of it is that there's a lot of day two operations built in. So once you deploy applications, you can relate them to each other. So let's say you want to relate uh, your Kubernetes worker to the control plane. It's a simple relation in a model that you define in YAML, so it makes it simple. And when you want to scale your cluster, for example, you want to add a Kubernetes node, you can simply do like juju, add unit, Kubernetes worker, and it's going to scale for you. You can also reduce, uh, you can upgrade and update. Um, so that's the main manager that we're using in this cloud. In terms of observability, it's pretty standard. Uh, we're using an open source project uh, that I'm sure a lot of you are using as well. So Elasticsearch, Grafana, Prometheus. Since the whole deployment is done on Ubuntu servers, we're also using the landscape server. Um, that tool lets you uh, see if you have security vulnerabilities in your environment, uh, depending on the version of packages that you're using. Uh, so we are also using that. And then for the um, secrets management tool for Kubernetes, uh, we're using Vault. Um, and since it's deployed on those three infrastructure nodes, it's also HA and we're using AG proxy in front of it. So now for the actual Kubernetes deployment, um, control plane, we decided to do um, the control plane on three nodes with um, standard components. All of these components are operators or charms that are deployed with Juju. Um, so Calico for the networking, we got HCD, QBPI load balancer. And then for the workers, we had two different sets of workers. We have generic workers, Dell machines, uh, pretty standard uh, and powerful. And then we have specific GPU nodes. So those are NVIDIA DGX A100 that we use in this case. Um, and I'll go a little bit more in detail uh, into how we integrate that to provide GPUs uh, for the pods in a few minutes. Um, and finally, for the storage aspect of the cluster, we use Ceph. In some architecture, you may see Ceph deployed hyperconverge with Kubernetes, so you could have your Ceph OSDs directly on each Ceph or uh, on each Kubernetes worker. Um, it's not the case in this case. We connected to an external, well, standalone Ceph cluster separate from the Kubernetes cluster. Um, the main reason for that is that that Ceph cluster is used for 
a, a few other um, clusters in the environment. So for example, the OpenStack connects to it. Uh, some users can use the uh, file share system from it separately from the Kates cluster. So Ceph provides persistent volumes for, uh, for Kates. Uh, it can provide block storage. Uh, we have uh, S3 and also, yeah, CephFS. Um, let's go into the different integrations we've done. Um, first, of course, the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, one of the neat things about the NVIDIA nodes is that they publish the GPU operator, which makes it pretty easy to, um, to set up. If you install the GPU operator on your NVIDIA nodes, you don't have to set up your OS in a very specific way, like we just had Ubuntu Vanilla, then you have the GPU operator deployed in Kubernetes, and that's a little bit what you see with the different pods here. There's a discovery pod that will go and scan your nodes and find which one have GPUs, um, and it will install the proper drivers inside of pods to very, really simplify the setup overall. And then one feature that we used uh, from NVIDIA is the multi-instance GPU profiles. Essentially, that lets you slice your GPU into smaller instances. Um, one DGX node has eight GPU cards, and they're really powerful. Um, and those nodes are also really expensive. So there's a limit to like how many you want to purchase for your cluster. In this case, if you slice your GPU into like smaller slices, you're able to provide more uh, GPUs for different types of workloads that may have different requirements. And it also makes it so that each GPU is uh, independent from each other. So in our, in our case, we deployed three nodes with no MIG profiles and then one node with the seven slices per GPU um, profile. And that's also something that you can change later on when you see that the need or the request for one type of GPU is, is greater than the other. So it makes it uh, pretty uh, easy to use. And then to configure those profiles, it's simply a label on the nodes. Uh, so once you label your node with a specific type of profile, uh, the GPU operator picks up that uh, configuration and configures it for you. Um, so you see a, a count of 56 here for the seven slices for eight cards on the one node that we set up like that. Um, on the networking side, we use MetalLB. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, Kubernetes and public clouds, well, you have access to application balancers that you don't have to, to do magic to have set up in your environment. But on bare metal, unless you purchase expensive appliances um, that do you know, hardware load balancing, uh, you don't have that many options. So MetalB is a really useful open source project that can uh, simplify your life um, for load balancing in Kates. So essentially, you give a set of external or public IPs that you want MetalB to be able to assign to pods. And if a pod requests a service type of a type, uh, well, a service of type load balancer, um, it will get an external IP. There's two different modes. Um, layer two is preferred unless you have switches that are able to do BGP. So in our case, we did a layer two uh, setup. Next, authentication. Um, you can do you know, local users for your case. You can connect to LDAP. You can connect to IDC provi providers. Uh, but in the university's environment, um, SAML is used extensively in a lot of different environments, so we decided to do a SAML uh, authentication. Um, it might surprise you that we're using Keystone to make that possible. For those of you who are familiar with OpenStack, Keystone is an OpenStack project. But the way that um, we develop the operators, you can connect the Keystone operator to Kubernetes control plane, and it will request its authentication through Keystone and then we connected Keystone to the SAML backend. So that makes it a lot easier for UEB to manage their, their uh, users. Uh, and you can define the access level in your case cluster through policies and in the SAML backend. Um, the SAML part was probably the trickiest part. 
um, a little bit because of networking, um, when you have to f make sure that your pods talk to the right thing, <coughs> excuse me, um, that you have Keystone talking to the SAML backend and all that. I'm not gonna go in detail through this, but I wanted to give a shout out to Gustavo Sanchez, a guy on my team who helped a lot with uh, making this work. And then finally, the last integration I wanna highlight is the GitLab integration. So we were able to do um, uh, integration with GitLab so all of your runners from your CI CD pipeline can run in Kubernetes. Sorry, you got something in my throat. Um, and save your uh, container into your GitLab registry. So on that, I'm gonna leave it to uh, John Paul to continue with the research aspect of the project. Thanks, Camille. Um, so what, what I thought I'd do is uh, give you a little bit of an um, overview of um, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, just to kind of help you understand the, the scope and the place in which this deployment is occurring. So uh, UAB is a large public institution located in Birmingham, but the metro area has about a million, a little bit more than a million people in it. That represents about a fifth of the state, um, the population of the state. Um, we also are the largest employer in the state and have a very large economic impact in, on the region. So uh, academically, we have about um, over 20,000 enrolled students. Um, a good third of those are in the graduate uh, research space, um, post-undergraduate space. And um, we generate about 600 million um, annually in uh, research funding from the different national um, uh, funding agencies like the NIH heavily and the NSF. Um, research Computing, the group that I'm with, we're part of the IT organization at UAP that serves the campus. We have about uh, 200 monthly users and um, our, our researchers represent about 30% of the research rev uh, revenue at, um, at the university. So um, if you know anything about sports in Alabama, um, just to highlight, we're the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Our mascot is a dragon not an elephant. Um, so anyway, the, um, what I'll do is I'll just talk a little bit about why we were interested in Kate's to begin with. Um, I'll kind of talk about how it sits in our research um, infrastructure and then uh, kind of go over some of the future um, use cases we see for, for Kate's in the research environment. So um, a lot of the Kate's use cases that um, we have are what you might consider you know, uh, standard fare for microservices. We have a, a self-service application that we're building for users at our university, for our researchers, to be able to kind of manage their lab environments, um, manage the resources that we provide for them, the IT services specifically around computation. And um, we have the, you know, an, uh, an automatic user provisioning workflow, a group management workflow that we're developing. And we've deployed that on a traditional kind of message-based application on traditional infrastructure. We're very interested in moving that over to a Kate's platform and making that a microservices experience. Um, we also um, are working with uh, essentially the leading adopters of Kate's on campus. Um, we have a few users that have built their own um, Kate's platform that they're running in the cloud, they're interested in bringing that onto campus. And we have some use cases that are kind of leading um, research use cases for applications that already exist um, that are uh, Kate's oriented. Um, so one of the primary spaces though that we're working on right now is that CI CD integration. Um, basically, as we build these applications, we wanna be able to make sure that we don't fall behind in our, in our workloads. One of the problems that we had in our own development was that we would just essentially get a huge um, merge backlog in our workflow. And so we're able to use the CI CD pipelines that we're now moving over to Kate's to help clear that out by having uh, nightly builds and, and moving forward with that. So uh, the kind of the leading edge of the use cases that kind of drove us to saying, hey, we really need to get a Kate's capability on campus is this machine learning ops workflow that's becoming more and more popular out there. Um, one of the characteristics of ML ops, um, if you know Kubeflow or um, MLflow or Nextflow, is that um, machine learning um, applications tend to want a lot of control over the environmental configuration that they have, and they want to kind of be deeply integrated 
integrated with the workflow of the machine learning pipeline. And so that makes them a hard fit into what might be more traditional compute environments. And so we wanted to make sure we had a Kates platform available. That's why we kind of peppered it with some GPUs as, um, uh, also along the way. So I think it's also helpful to understand what we mean when we speak in terms of like research computing and high performance computing. We tend to think of our platform as uh, units of uh, high performance computing. And a high performance computer in our environment is something that has um, a considerable amount of RAM. Um, you know, three to um, 100 gigabytes is very common. Uh, we have a few that have a, above a terabyte. We have a couple of CPUs. They have you know, 24 to 64 cores on them, and then we may have accelerators in those nodes. Um, each of those nodes definitely has a high-speed NIC on them to let the data move on and off the um, node itself. And of course, in, in the HPC context, you think in terms of speeds of network, and so you want to keep your, your data close to your CPU at the highest speed, and then your internal um, networks at the next highest speed, and then your uh, data um, ingestion onto the node at the, at the lowest speed, if you will. So. Um, we combine those uh, compute resources into clusters. So we just kind of buy a bunch of them at a time and we stick them together and we operate them on a connected network. Um, and then we uh, make, make it possible for them to pass data in between each other and reach the uh, essentially the global file system that we run as GPFS. That's what we use on our HPC side. And we have uh, Ceph, as uh, Camille mentioned, uh, for various use cases for block object and also some um, essentially leading uh, uh, file system type solutions that we're exploring. We, we combine those into a fabric that we then expose in different uh, compute flavors. And our kind of bread and butter compute flavor is the HPC batch compute flavor. We run the Slurm scheduler, if you're familiar with that. What you do inside Slurm is you ask for a certain amount of RAM, a certain amount of cores and nodes for a certain period of time, and then Slurm allocates that when it's available and ensures that nobody else is competing for that resource um, with you. Um, typically, in, an, in a batch computing environment, you tend to think in terms of a terminal-based access, an SSH access, um, and uh, uh, that is uh, certainly true in our case as well, but we've also deployed an on-demand, open on-demand platform, which is a web GUI that you wrap around your cluster, and it provides a really easy-to-use resource for researchers where they can do pretty much everything that they need to do with an HPC cluster inside their browser. So including running like MATLAB and other traditional X11 applications in a VNC session inside their desktop. Uh, it also provides uh, uh, essentially web proxy capabilities. So you can tie a web proxy into a job and you can run things that are kind of web native like Jupyter Notebooks and RStudio and things of that nature. But a lot of our researchers just run their traditional SMP or MPI applications or even their pleasantly parallel single core independent data uh, workflows on the HPC batch. And like I said, that's our biggest workload engine right now today for, for research at UAB. Uh, we also have an OpenStack cloud, and we provided that um, primarily so that we could have the, uh, an easy to use platform when the impedance mis mismatch to our cluster is high. Right? So if you have, for example, a, a, a science gateway, that's a very common tool that people want to run. It's some sort of a web application that hides the details of a complex platform um, behind the back end and exposes to the end user something that they can get started with right away, kind of like our on-demand platform, but often these are geared towards specific science domains. Uh, that lets a new graduate student or new researcher get on board using computation and analysis in their world much more quickly. So you can't readily deploy one of those or easily deploy one of those into an HPC batch cluster. There's a lot of things that don't work with that. So that's one of the reasons why we have OpenStack. We also have it to help with our development workloads. We actually do um, development cluster builds on, on that OpenStack platform. Uh, even when you want to use a container-like model in HPC Bash with Singularity, you still need an environment where you can be root to build that container. So for all of those reasons, we have an OpenStack uh, cloud. And then as I mentioned, um, we were pursuing Kates because we know we need a container-based abstraction and uh, kind of an orchestration workload um, manager 
for uh, you know next gen machine learning applications. Uh, we also uh, are interested, as I mentioned, move, moving our CI CD workflows on there and starting to build more of a composable application environment for users. Um, and as you can see, I mentioned some of the, um, the tooling, the R Shiny, Streamlit, Snake Make, and Nextflow. Those are a lot of the tools that we see as uh, you know, desiring the container backends. And right now, we, we didn't have a platform on which to um, uh, make that easy to just consume those uh, um, containerized uh, components of those workflows easily. So just as a kind of a reference related to Camille's uh, uh, slides, this is where we're currently using Maz and uh, Juju and Charm deployments inside of our environment. So we use it for our OpenStack cloud. Uh, we use it for our Kate's container environment. And we're working actively to migrate our Ceph platform over to that. It's still going to be an independent Ceph cluster for the same reasons that we needed to have it independent to begin with. But um, uh, the uh, provisioning is going to happen through, through Maz and Juju. Our HPC batch is still done in a traditional HPC batch way. Um, and the GPFS is an independent file system. So. Um, Kind of in conclusion, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about the, the next-gen use case that we really see for, for Kate's, the one that I think is among the more exciting um, spaces that we can spend our time with over the coming years. Um, as you can see on the uh, you know in the in the research environment, we have a lot of different data sources. We have scanners, we have microscopes, we have telescopes, not so much at UAV. We don't use telescopes. We're a medical university, so we tend to think in terms of scanners and microscopes. Um, but you also have other data sources, you know, gene banks and other things like that that already have existing data sets that come in. And they come into your environment. And ideally, those just kind of stream into your environment and they have the associated um, workloads uh, kind of just managed and um, the customizations that you have to do to your data to publish that data automatically run. And then on the, on the right-hand side, we have our, um, essentially our analysts sitting there composing uh, analytical workflows through the, through the uh, Kate's platform. So they can work with uh, things like Jupyter. Up at the top is an example of a Jupyter application that's loading a lot of data up inside it and uh, presenting a, you know, a satellite image of the, of the globe, obviously. But um, that needs to basically allow the users not just to consume the data coming off the platform, but package up that computation that they did to produce this new data set back into the platform so that it can be used by other uh, researchers downstream. So they don't just become consumers of data sets, they also become kind of instantaneously or immediately producers of data sets as well. And I think that that's a really powerful enabler that we're going to be seeing more of over time um, as we continue to adopt the Kate's platform. Another use case that I think is uh, kind of critical for the reproducibility of research um, in um, higher education is to be able to encapsulate the HPC workloads, so the, the work that they did on our HPC batch computer, to be able to capture that and then be able to reproduce it at some point in the future and get out the same data that they had when they did their analysis and drew their conclusions on the cluster originally. And Obviously, they could just go back and run it on the cluster again, but clusters, even though they're kind of a slow-moving animal, their OSs are reasonably stable. They don't change very often. The, the OSs, the applications, the, um, the, the storage environments, they do change over time. And so if you want to come back five years later and reproduce a run, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So being able to essentially capture all of that up into a container that then completely reproduces that batch computing experience that they had by loading modules and um, you know, referencing their different data sources on the, on the disk, um, would be a very, very helpful uh, reproducibility tool for researchers uh, over time. And that requires that it doesn't 
you know, this is not something that the researchers really want to sit around and design, so you want to make it possible for them to essentially say, okay, now capture this environment that I used and give me a container that allows me to come back and use it again in the future. So um, this is what I'm kind of uh, terming like the, the next-gen science gateway, this platform where you essentially are able to move across um, the uh, different areas of your work flow in research and uh, modify it and reproduce it um, effectively. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending our, our talk. Uh, you're welcome to um, come reach out to us individually if you want to know more about either of these uh, uh, efforts or stop by the booth or um, just to kind of keep a conversation going here if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we, have a, we have quite a few minutes for, for questions. A any questions, just raise the hand. Oh, okay, last gentleman. Thank you, that was very entertaining. Um, so, on your traditional HPC batch cluster, you're obviously able to use tools like Torque and Slurm to handle resource contention and queuing. Um, do you already have an infrastructure like that in place for Kubernetes to um, handle, say, um, you know, a similar resource, um, resource contention between researchers. So if one researcher wants all the GPUs indefinitely, um, do, is there another tool or middleware to kind of handle that, um, you know, batch queuing so that um, not everything is allocated to a specific, to a single or a specific workload? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. And the answer, the quick answer is no, we don't yet. But we know that that's an issue. Um, obviously, in the in the batch computing, the reason why people do batch computing is for really kind of I guess two two reasons is one. Um, access to bare metal uh, performance, right? You don't get any kind of interference from abstraction layers. And two is that you can share the resources. Batch schedulers are very good at um, disciplining that over time. Um, our Kate's environment does not have anything to essentially stop a researcher from having all the resources. What I would like to see and where I'm exploring with my team um, uh, the capabilities of Kate's and HPC to come together is how we might be able to manifest some of the um, HPC capacity as a Kate's worker platform. So that's one approach that you could potentially use where you basically say, okay, well, I have this Kate's workload or this Kate's demand for for resources, and I can schedule that into my batch scheduling environment. Now that has problems, obviously, for immediate reaction the way Kate's tends to have you know, immediate responses. So there's gonna to have to be other ways that we look at that. And I've only really started scratching the surface on how the Kate's containers can you know, uh, schedule or let's say make reservations for their cores and RAM. But one of the things that I haven't really come to understand or come across a solution for is how to stop them at a particular point in time, right? Kate's tends to run forever and Batch tends to run to completion, so. But if you have any if you have any suggestions on it, then I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Thank you. Okay, there's another gentleman there. Uh, on the way, my suggestion is that you need to have a two-level scheduler. So in theory, that could be the NP complete problem. But let's go, go for the next question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is regarding. Um, CUDA versions, so we run in the cloud. I have some ML engineers that want to use CUDA 10 and some that want to use CUDA, CUDA 11. Um, right now I have to spin up two different node groups, one with, two, with manual AMIs, some of them have CUDA 10, some have CUDA 11. Uh, is that a good way to manage that? How, how would you suggest maybe doing something like that? Um, well, I mean, when we, when we have that requirement, we just spin up different um, uh, environments as well. We we have typically been able to move forward with CUDA, so we tend to be on CUDA 11 on our cluster right now, and so we're pretty consistent across CUDA 11. But um, for something where we would have to go to CUDA 10, that would be a case where we would uh, use our OpenStack environment to um, use a GPU from that environment. So every one of our environments has GPUs available to it, but also with the um, one of our kind of our visions for starting to leverage MAS more heavily is to be able to kind of say, well, we need more capacity for um, this kind of workflow in one environment over the other. And so we can potentially move that compute capacity over for a period of time. But right now it's just a, we're kind of in the same space you are 
um, no, no great solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So now it's the last question for today. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the typically when you are using containers for uh, machine learning projects like this, the models or the containers can be very large to incorporate mm -hmm. uh, these things. Is there anything in your architecture specifically to handle those types of issues? Uh, to, you mean to, to um, ensure that there's enough um, uh, G, uh, memory resources for that? Is that what you're kind of referring to? Or, Either, um, yeah, memory or, or bandwidth on the network or uh, things like that. Um, I wouldn't say that there's something specific in the architecture to handle that. We have, we have uh, used nodes in our environment that are um, generously provisioned. So our A100s have, uh, they're 40 gig A100s, so they have a lot of RAM on there. Um, and then we have a lot of um, memory available on the nodes that are the worker nodes. Um, so um, I guess we're kind of maybe cheating a little bit um, in the sense that we, we know we have those um, uh, that capacity in our environment, and we don't have it, uh, you know, over um, uh, kind of oversubscribed yet because we don't have a, a demand that goes beyond it yet. But um, in my mind, the way we would go is with that additional scheduling model, where we would basically say, okay, well, you need this much RAM, and so we'll just have to go and get that out of a resource pool, either by um, you know, physically moving, uh, physically, but virtually moving one re compute resource over into another fabric, or by doing one of those uh, secondary scheduling layers where we could basically uh, bring in Slurm to help us uh, uh, allocate some resources um, for a particular compute workload. Uh, okay, so now we end for the research and academic session for the Cooper Count. Thank you for everyone, the participation. See you next year. Thank you. Thank you.